What is a community? Well, for the purposes of our discussion today, we will define a community as a group of organisms, both plants and animals, living together in a particular region. In that case, Minneapolis would be a community, wouldn't it? Because in it we have uh, animals, such as people, cats and dogs, and plants, such as grass and trees, living together in a particular region. For the same reason, this aquarium would be a community. Because the aquarium has in it plants and animals living together in water within this region of the aquarium. The Mississippi River is also a community. For in it, we also have plants and animals living together. The community of the Mississippi is not as clear as the water we would have in the aquarium, though. It's very murky because the Mississippi carries along, carries along a lot of sand and silt, which, in the moving river, as we see here, makes the water very murky. For this reason, to get some of the pictures of the animals you'll see, we've had to take the animals from a river community and place them into a special community where we could filter the water and get the murkiness out of it. I'd like to show you some examples, particularly of a food chain, of some of these animals which we would find in the Mississippi. In this scene, we see tiny fairy shrimp swimming in the water. They feed on microscopic plants. Actually, they're no bigger than the head of a match, or even a little smaller than that. Small, with lots of legs. In the same region, we'd find many minnows. These minnows are also looking for food. One of their favorite foods happens to be fairy shrimp. Here comes one now. And again. But the minnow too has enemies. In this case, it's a garfish. He sees him. He opens his mouth. He has the minnow. And the garfish finally completes his dinner. What we have seen so far is a chain in which we had animals living one right after the other. For instance, we found that the fairy shrimp would feed on microscopic plants, and the minnows would feed upon the fairy shrimp, and the minnow in turn being eaten by a giant garfish. However, it's not always this simple in nature. We will have comp uh, kinks or in our chain of the communities of the Mississippi. For instance, have any of you ever heard of a um, frog being eaten by an insect? Or even a fish being eaten by an insect? It happens. Let me show you some examples. Here's a giant water beetle. A small minnow is swimming by. He waits carefully, carefully, and strikes. And the water pe beetle returns to the twig on which he was resting. The minnow hit now is food for this water beetle. In 
the same region, there is also dragonfly nymphs. This fellow that you see is the young of a dragonfly. Also we see a tadpole or polywog. He missed, but this time he succeeds. And the dragonfly feeds on the tadpole. But not all of the tadpoles are killed. Some of them get away. And eventually they become frogs. Did you see him? Again, he'll flip his tongue. And our frog eats a butterfly. But the frog too must return to the water. In the water he has enemies. This crayfish is one of them. But the frog sees him and gets away. But another crayfish lies in hiding. Carefully, very carefully, he has him. And the crayfish feeds on the frog. A bass is always hungry. And this one is no exception. Here comes a crayfish now. He has him. But no, he doesn't. Yes, he does. No, he doesn't. And finally, he has him. But the bass is always looking for more food. This minnow is also his food. But the bass is still hungry. He's still looking for more food. Does that look like a fish? He strikes. And man has entered the community of the Mississippi too, hasn't he? We have seen that one factor that animals living in the Mississippi must depend upon is food. But there is another factor within this community that they truly must depend upon. This factor is oxygen. There are two ways in which oxygen is supplied to these animals but both times it is dissolved in the water in a similar way that you would dissolve salt or sugar in a glass of water. One of the ways that oxygen gets into the water is by green plants in the presence of light. I'd like to show you a demonstration of how we can show that a gas or oxygen is given off by these plants. I have here a funnel which I'm going to, to fill with some of the green plants in this aquarium. Crumple them up a little. A few more. I then take and turn the funnel over in this small jar of water. taking a test tube and filling it with water placing my thumb over the top I then place my thumb under water release it and place it over the tip of the funnel now in the presence of light these green plants will produce oxygen. But it would take several hours before I could show you enough gas that has been produced. I do have one here that I prepared the day before. Yesterday I prepared it. And you will notice that already there is a small bubble at the top of this test tube. Can you see it? This gas is oxygen. But there is another way that oxygen can get into the water. 
and this is by rapid moving streams picking up the oxygen from the air. Air is about one-fifth oxygen. We can even increase the amount of oxygen in an aquarium simply by bubbling air through it. Do you notice these bubbles coming from the aquarium? These bubbles are increase the quantity of oxygen in the aquarium. We have seen two factors that all animals need that live in the community. One is food and the other is oxygen. Remember at the beginning of the program, we said defined a community. And do you suppose there's anything in the Mississippi community that man needs in his community? What would it be? That's right, the water itself. But before he can use that water, it must have some very special characteristics. For instance, First of all, it, above all, it must be safe to drink. It must also taste good, must look good, and must even smell good. Now when the water is taken from the Mississippi, it does contain many materials which we would not want in our drinking water. I have a diagram here which shows how our water is purified. When the water comes in, it is screened to remove any large particles which may be in the water, such as leaves and trees, or even fish. And the water is brought in, but it contains in it sand, suspended material which won't settle out, bacteria, and other small materials in the water. When the water comes in, carbon is added to the water. The carbon removes unpleasant tastes and smells in the water. I'm sure that no one would want to drink water which tasted fishy, would they? Lime is then added to the water. The lime does two things. First of all, it takes out any minerals which are dissolved, many of the minerals which are dissolved in the water, and it also has a chemical action on the water which allows the alum to work better in the water. This alum with lime forms a jelly-like material. When it is stirred into the water, it picks up any of the suspended material and the lime and the carbon and all of these materials are carried to the settling tank. In this settling tank, these materials, which are heavier than the water, drop to the bottom, and the water is skimmed off of the top. Carbon dioxide is added to the water. This carbon dioxide has the effect of counteract counteracting excuse me, the effect of the lime. Ammonia and chlorine are added so that together they may kill any of the harmful bacteria which may be in the water. Then all of the water is taken and sent through a sand filter. This sand filter screens out any of the materials which did not settle out and also any of the bacteria which were killed in the water. The, the material which would be filtered out would include some of the carbon and lime and the alum as well as some of the materials which originally came into the water. I have a filter set up here which can show you how our water is filtered. In this flask, I have some very muddy water. And I'm going to take it and pour it into this sand filter. You'll notice that the water that comes out 
is very clear. Our filters in Minneapolis are much bigger than this. In fact, they uh, have a better than 30 inches of sand in them. After the water is filtered, to make sure that the water is safe, even all the way to your home, ammonia and chlorine are added again. In case any bacteria should get into the pipes from a break or something like that, the ammonia and chlorine are added again. inches of sand in them. After the water is filtered, to make sure that the water is safe, even all the way to your home, ammonia and chlorine are added again. In case any bacteria should get into the pipes from a break or something like that, the ammonia and chlorine are added again to be sure that that water is free from harmful bacteria. Fluorine is added to the water to give you strong teeth. And finally, the water is taken into the, into the storage tank and finally pumped out to your home. Reviewing briefly then, our water system, the water is first screened to remove the larger materials. Carbon is added to take out unpleasant tastes and odors. Lime was added for one, to remove the, what is it? That's right, to remove the minerals in the water and to soften the water so that it isn't hard. Alum was added to make a jelly-like material which would pick up any of the suspended particles, or many of them I should say, and finally take them to the settling tank. Carbon dioxide was added to the water to counteract the action of the lime here. And finally, ammonia and chlorine are added to the water so that we would have water free from harmful bacteria. The water was filtered. And incidentally, I can tell you how much water can be filtered by our Minneapolis water system. In one day, 130 million gallons of water have been filtered in our sand filters in Minneapolis. You say, well, that's a lot of water, but how much is it? Well, if we took a square city block, which is about 300 feet on each side, it would make a tank of water about 200 feet high. Or this is about 8 to 10 houses high, if you want to think of it that way. After filtering, again, we added ammonia and chlorine to be sure that the water was safe when it got to your home. Fluorine was added so that your teeth would be strong. And finally, the water was stored and sent to your home. Our water supply here in Minneapolis comes then from the Mississippi. But I wonder, we've talked about two communities, Hellfire, three, haven't we? The aquarium, the Minneapolis community, and also the Mississippi community. And I wonder if maybe you would be interested in looking at some other communities, such as the park near your home. This is one community, isn't it? Because in it, there are usually plants and animals. Or you may be interested in a community which you could find in a lake. And also, you may be interested to know
note the extreme size of our Minneapolis water purification plant. For an example, I'd like to show you a slide of what an actual settling tank looks like. This is a large tank. In fact, there are at least six of them. And you can imagine how big they would have to be to take in over 130 million gallons of water a day. We only see the surface of the water, but underneath the water, they look somewhat like a cone. And the material settled to the bottom, and the sludge, which is the material that was heavy, drops to the bottom where it is scraped away. Today then, we have seen how the community of Minneapolis is able to take from one community, which is the Mississippi, one very important factor. What was that factor? It was the water itself. Man, incidentally, has to be very careful because of often he may add materials to the water which could take away the oxygen which could kill the fish. What are these materials and how do they work? Well, materials which decompose and rot would eventually take up the oxygen that is in the water and the fish would die from lack of oxygen. Also, there may be materials in the water, such as poisons, which kill the fish directly. These ma materials are grouped under the heading of pollution. And certainly, we would want to have water which is not polluted. Because when we have polluted water, we have water which is unsafe, can cause disease. It's unpleasant to be around because begins to smell, and also, it wouldn't be a very fine recreation spot, would it? We couldn't go swimming, or boating, or even have picnics along the riverbanks. It's very important, then, that man uh, do something to check pollution. Today, we have seen how man has taken just the one factor from the community of the Mississippi and has used it for his own good. I hope you'll enjoy investigating other communities. Science Grade 7, a telecourse presented by the Minneapolis Public Schools. Your teacher today has been Richard F. Ruffey. The underwater pictures in this lesson were excerpts from the film Underwater Reflections by J.W. Wilkie. The entire film is available for classroom use by calling Tuxedo 1-5831. Subject Area Consultant supervise the planning of each series, which is authorized by the Advisory Committee on Educational Television. Teams of teachers assist in the planning and evaluating of the various lessons presented. Series are produced to the Radio Television Department of the Minneapolis Public Schools. Your studio director has been Louis House.